They've done their part, having served in Canada's armed forces on land, by sea, and in the air. Yet, for veterans caught up in pay and benefit backlogs, ongoing now for more than a decade, under both the Conservatives and the Liberals, they're still waiting for the federal government to do its part. Are they hearing anything to give them hope in this election campaign? Let's ask. In Montreal, Quebec, via Skype, Tom D. Irvin, Dominion President, the Royal Canadian Legion. In the nation's capital, Lee Berthume, political reporter at the Canadian Press. And here in our studio, Sean Bruyer, a retired Canadian Air Force intelligence officer, and Rosemary Park, Lieutenant Commander, who is now retired, and Chair of Service Women's Salute Canada. Welcome to you all. Thank you, Nat. Uh, we really appreciate your time and being here to speak about something that I think more people should be talking about. Um, Tom, I want to give you the first question. Uh, you're with the Legion. We can't assume everyone knows how it works. So tell us, what does the Legion do? The Legion, in a nutshell, the Legion is the largest veteran organization in Canada. We uh, we have over 260,000 members, and we're strong advocates of veterans, veteran services, to taking care of our currently serving members. We have a, a whole wide range of, of advocacy right across the board to make sure that our veterans are taken care of in the past and in, in the future. And Rosemary, um, can you tell us about Service Women Salute Canada? Thank you. Um, Service Women Salute Canada is the organizing backbone for uh, a mission, uh, a quest, a journey, uh, and an invitation to know, to honour, and to strengthen the 133-year contribution of service women to Canada. 133 years? 133 years. years. Um, um, retired Supreme Court Justice Marie Deschamps uh, called us an invisible force. And so, so invisible because invisible. we don't know much about you. Or? We, it isn't. Um, we're not well known, and uh, being a minority group within a much larger uh, male organization, uh, the voices have not often been heard. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, a chance for us to strengthen uh, that knowledge mm -hmm. and start sharing our story. Well, let's talk about um, what it looks like for veterans in Canada. We have some numbers to go through and then we can unpack it a little bit. As of last year, there were about 48,000 war service veterans in Canada, most of those from the Second World War, the rest from the Korean War. The number of Canadian Armed Forces veterans was just over 600,000. As of last December, there were more than 27,000 disability claims in the system. Of those, 57% were waiting for more than four months for benefits. Um, Tom, what kind of benefits do veterans get from the government? They get a whole range of, of benefits. The uh, Veteran Wellbeing Act uh, takes care of them in many different situations. Uh, the, the Veterans Affairs takes care of our, our, uh, not, not only our older veterans from, from Korea and World War II, but the modern day veteran now with the um, the different act, the, the well-being act that came out. Um, there's, there's, uh, they, they're taken care of not only financially but uh, with medical care, with uh, equipment that they need, um, any number of things. For, hopefully, in most cases, uh, from the time they get out until uh, and, and they get all the services that that they actually need for the disability that they have. Uh, Lee, did uh, you want to add to that? Oh, sorry. Well, I think what I was thinking as as Tom was talking there was uh, it's important to to realize as we're talking about veterans, as we're setting up this conversation, that we really have a, a, several varieties, different types of veterans. We have, as you pointed out, your veterans who are from the Second World War in Korea. Then we have veterans who are from uh, who served in peacekeeping missions, and then we have those who are more recent through Afghanistan and other uh, other missions like Iraq. So just just as Tom was talking there, I, that's what I was thinking about is we need to realize that we have kind of three different groups of veterans, Why all of whom have different needs, all of whom have okay. different uh, different priorities. Well, I was going to just uh, interject, uh, sorry to uh, interrupt. No. Why is it important to distinguish that, to make that point? 
Because I, we've got a veteran community that's very varied. Uh, I think this is something that perhaps uh, people forget when we're talking about veterans, is we have uh, people who are in their 90s, um, you know, all the way down to people who have just gotten out of, you know, who have released because of perhaps medical uh, injuries or because of injuries from basic training and they're 18, 19 years old. These people, as, uh, you know, as we're looking at veterans, we have uh, people who have different needs, different priorities. Um, and so uh, just as we're setting up this conversation, I think it's important to realize that, um, you know, that this is, the, the, this is such a big community that we're talking about. And so each of these has different issues, and uh, I'm sure we're going to get into that. Um, Sean, did you want to add anything to that? Sure. So, yeah. you know, Lee's absolutely right in terms of the varied population. I mean, when we talk about Canadian Forces veterans, the 600,000, um, like Lee said, we have ranges from age from anywhere from 18, 19, all the way up into their 70s and 80s. Um, and in that situation, it's also important to remember a lot of people think that, you know, the post-World War II, post-Korea War uh, efforts um, were not that dangerous. And so therefore, a lot of the comprehensive benefits, which we can talk about later, that went to World War II veterans were not given to the Canadian Forces veterans because it was assumed it wasn't as dangerous uh, really? to serve in peacetime. Yeah, which, which is a bit bizarre because if you look at the numbers now, we're looking at now we have uh, about 100,000 uh, veterans that are on disability benefits, meaning that they suffer a life-disabling injury because of their military service. That we have injury numbers now amongst Canadian Forces veterans that uh, the percentage-wise has, uh, has now surpassed the number of people that were injured in World War II that came forward and claimed for benefits. Mm -hmm. Part of that is because of the culture. People are a little more open to, to apply for benefits. But it doesn't diminish the fact that peacetime service, peacekeeping service, uh, peacetime war service, these are all inherently dangerous missions. Um, and Rosemary, how much trust is there between veterans and the government right now? The trust, it, I think, breaks down into trust in the Canadian military and how they have um, responded to their, their military service while in service and in their transition. And then more generally, I think you would say it's veterans affairs, so we, we sort of categorize the two mm -hmm. as while you were in service as you're leaving and then as you now are under the the responsibility mm -hmm. of veterans affairs but to all of our points uh, for example service women and service men for service women only 11 percent of veteran women are receiving disability benefits from veterans affairs so we have a larger audience of service women and men for whom Veterans Affairs um, is only um, indirectly mm -hmm. involved in supporting. You said 11%. Um, so who decides who gets benefits? It's, it's complicated, uh -huh. and it depends upon your service, time in service. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in the military, which was 25 years ago, a veterans affairs was known to reject your claim. You might have left under medical release, but your chances were slim that it was going to be responded to and treated favorably. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, Sean, you want to give a more up-to-date uh, uh, from that context of the early yeah. 80s, 90s. And certainly, Rosemary. And, and if I, you know, we can hearken back is that, <clears throat> that Right now, Veterans Affairs exists primarily to serve the disabled veteran. Um, but that's not why Veterans Affairs was created. Veterans Affairs was created to serve all veterans, not just in memorials you know, that are put around the country or services that are held on Remembrance Day, but Veterans Affairs was created because they realized that military culture in itself made individuals dependent upon government because the, the military structure is such that they don't want people going to the front line or worrying about paperwork back home when they have to make, you know, snap decisions, split second, uh, life or death implications for those decisions. So, so we still have created a culture where, where veterans not only are create more dependency upon, you know, government in terms of um, taking care of a lot of these menial and administrative tasks, mm -hmm. but veterans are deeply indoctrinated to obey authority, to be loyal to the country they have, to not question the political system. Because why would, why would I go and fight for something that I doubt, right? We have to believe deeply 
that Canada and its values are something worth dying for. So that inherently sets up a situation which we recognize in World War II, that you know, there was a boot camp to go into the military. They recognize that every veteran needed a boot camp to get out of the military. We've lost sight of that. Um, and, and that's sad because Veterans Affairs has now been, like I say, being seen as serving only the disabled, when there is probably a large population of veterans that could have further optimized the potential when they rejoin civilian life, but they didn't have the help, they didn't have the coaching to do that. Well, we have um, a clip to show you, um, and this is, um, this is a, a clip of uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, and he's speaking to a veteran at a town hall in Edmonton, and this took place last year. Uh, let's take a look. I was prepared to be killed in action. What I wasn't prepared for, Mr. Prime Minister, is Canada turning its back on me. Why are we still uh, fighting against certain uh, veterans groups in court? Uh, because uh, they are asking for more than we are able to give right now. Um, they are asking for more than we... Well, no. Hang on. You're asking... You're asking for honest answers. The old veterans charter involved lump sum payments and very little in the way of services. We have significantly invested in services, rehabilitation, support, uh, investments, in training, in support for caregivers and families that have gone a long way towards improving the quality of life and outcomes uh, for veterans. Lee, is he right? There's a lot to unpack in that statement. Um, so first of all, the old disability pension system, it was basically provided um, veterans uh, a monthly payment, depending on how disabled they were. Um, this was, uh, and this is basically what a lot of veterans want because it was uh, today, they want it reinstated because it was done away with in 2005. Um, first, it was the, uh, the Martin government that um, introduced some legislation to get rid of the, uh, the old pension system and bring in this new system that basically gave veterans uh, a lump sum payment as well as uh, rehabilitation and uh, income uh, replacement if they couldn't find work and things like that. Um, that was passed in 2005. The Harper government implemented it in 2006. Um, so we did see uh, an increase in, we did see a change, I guess, where uh, the focus became less about providing um, financial assistance and more into, hey, let's, especially at a time when we've got younger veterans who are releasing for medical reasons, uh, let's get them kind of into the workforce. Let's give them uh, the uh, the tools, the training, or the counseling that they need to get to get in there. The problem was that the the system that was set up at that time was insufficient on both sides. So not only did it take away the financial stability that veterans uh, were were relying on, if you will, um, the the support and services that were being provided were also deemed as insufficient. So you had a lot of veterans who were falling through the cracks. Um, and so you've seen over the years, um, successive governments have tried to kind of fill those cracks, if you will, by introducing a variety of different programs and, and uh, you know, again, new rehab, new uh, mental health services, things like that. But it still hasn't gotten to the point where uh, veterans are, uh, I guess, they, they don't feel that they're getting uh, quite the level of support that they were under the old system. Um, and so this is what... Um, the uh, the master corporal who was talking to uh, Prime Minister Trudeau was referencing was this fight that veterans uh, of his generation have been waging against successive governments for a return to that old system, which Justin Trudeau promised in the last election he would bring back that old disability pension system. Uh, instead, what he did was he brought out uh, the Liberals introduced their own version, which even the Parliamentary Budget Office has found provides less support than what the old system did. Um, but are veterans better off now than with the other system? I would say that there are some who definitely are, but those are those aren't the most severely wounded. There are those who uh, who make that transition, uh, perhaps from uh, you know military life to civilian life and don't have as much of a need, don't have the need the support that uh, perhaps many others do. And it's those who are the most severely wounded or disabled um, that are continuing to fight. And uh, those are the ones who are worse off. Um, you know, lots of organizations have come out. There's the uh, the National Veterans Council, uh, or it's National Veterans uh, Council Association that has come out, NVCA, uh, and found as well that many veterans are worse off than they were under the old system. So, um, you know, on the one hand, some 
perhaps are doing better, but there are a lot that aren't. And those are the ones that I think a lot of Canadians are worried about, um, the ones who are, you know, having to continue to fight for benefits, for services, and struggling to, uh, to you know, kind of get their lives back in order, if you will. Um, I should say that we did invite Veteran Affairs Canada on the program, but because we're in an election cycle, they were unable to come. Um, Tom, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to that. How much trust is there between veterans and the government right now? I'm, I'm, I just want, I was going to jump in when Lee was talking. I agree with a lot of the points he said. There's a lot of stuff out there that's good for the, uh, the modern day veteran, as we like to call them. But I'm hearing with the Veteran Wellbeing Act, the most, uh, where it's fallen through the cracks is the most seriously injured. And, and that's a concern for me. Like, yes, there are a lot of new programs that could help the modern day veteran, but there's a lot of stuff that the governments are coming out with. A lot of these guys don't qualify for it. I'd like to see it more, a lot of things opened up more off, more into a larger, bigger uh, scale so that more of the junior ranks get to qualify, like education and things like that. Um, and talking about trust, I'm a big person on, on uh, social media, and the, there is a lot of mistrust out there. Um, and one of the concerns, I suppose, is that Trudeau has had a revol revolving door of veteran affairs ministers. Um, Sean, is that a problem? It's seriously a problem when we look at that as a part of a bigger picture. So we've had, what, five different veterans I think affairs? It's four. Uh, so we including Harjit Singh, who okay. was also mm -hmm. had both hats at one time. Mm -hmm. So we have five different ministers. Um, it really speaks to the fact, you know, on one hand, I was shocked by what Trudeau said about that we really can't afford, you know, the programs that veterans are asking for right now. Um, I was shocked, but at the same time, I was relieved because that has been the long-held knowledge amongst the veterans community mm -hmm. that we're always low priority. And, and we have to look at what, what kind of services are being offered. Why are we offering veterans a special service for serving in the military? The, the reality is, is that there's no other job that ha we have in Canada that someone can be ordered into a situation knowing full well they will lose their life uh, potentially. So that willingness to sacrifice, okay, has been in the past compensated in such a way as that we recognize that at a moment's notice, we'll deploy to Mali, or we'll deploy to Ukraine, or we'll deploy to any trouble spot of the world. Um, but we don't say, hey, you know what? We have to do this incrementally. I'm not ready right now. Come back to me in six months and I'll deploy. No, we have to deploy right away. So when the government responds, now that you paid your end of the bargain, uh, but we have to wait till we have enough money. We're going to do this incrementally, and all these programs have been incremental, right? We're talking now 12 years, 13 years, 14 years since the new Veterans Charter was implemented, now called the Veterans Wellbeing Act. Uh, and, and veterans are saying, wait a minute, I paid my part of the bargain on time. Why is government dragging its feet? It, it really shows a disrespect. Mm -hmm. And when we add that there's ministers, that this is considered an emotion, and we all know that Veterans Affairs Minister has very little sway in cabinet. Um, and then we add the fact that it's been, you know, low balls on the budget. When we add the fact that Tom was saying about the programs, the programs are extremely restrictive. There's an availability of programs. They certainly, they need to be improved. But even the ones that are existing, it's very difficult for veterans to access. Mm -hmm. So we had all these factors together. No wonder veterans are developing a distrust with government. Rosemary? In the past, um, this analysis that was being given to governments um, by Veterans Affairs was um, reliant on waiting for, in an epidemiological sense, to see patterns exist. What we're seeing starting in 2016 is you're starting to see evidence of long time trends in, in the patterns of veterans and difficulties that they're having. So if I give an example um, for service women, they never separated men from women in their analysis and in 2016 separated the two and all of a sudden whoa seeing service women have historically got different patterns and some of them very concerning more so than male what, veterans okay what patterns suicide for example um male veterans will commit the pattern is that they will tend to end their life uh, those that choose that uh, very recently after they have served. For women, it's 10 years. All, something happens and 
they make that choice. Mm -hmm. But their amount, the, the, the numbers, are putting them at a much higher rate than servicemen and civilian men and women accepting indigenous people. So all of a sudden we're seeing this troubling detail that at the surface level uh, in the past wasn't understood. Mm -hmm. So I, my confidence is that Veterans Affairs is uh, being serious in uh, digging deeper mm -hmm. to know more. Um, it's the action then that uh, than what they what, what happens. Right. Yeah. Lee, did you uh, want to add to that? Yeah, I was just, well, just um, maybe uh, just to talk about the challenge uh, women face. Um, I know that the uh, Veterans Ombudsman just last year wrote a report about the uh, the wait times that many veterans are having to are facing in terms of accessing, finding out whether they qualify, I should say, for uh, benefits. And women and uh, and uh, uh, French speaking veterans faced exorbitantly longer wait times on average than, uh, than uh, male English speaking. Mm -hmm. So that just speaks to the challenge that women are facing. But what I was gonna say earlier was, I think uh, just to go back to uh, you know, the, the, the trust issue, if you will, is today's veterans, what they're seeing is, for them it's an issue of fairness in many respects, because they're looking mm -hmm. at past generations and the, the, the disability pension, it's a huge issue just because of that fairness aspect. You had, that was introduced after the First World War um, to care for all veterans, and it was in place until 2005, 2006. And so you're seeing today's veterans, especially those who served in Afghanistan, saying, well, how, why am I getting less? Why, am I be, why is my life worth less? Why is my service worth less? Um, um, you know, why, why, what is different about me than that previous generation? And part of it goes back to money, for sure, as Sean had said. Um, you know, the Parliamentary Budget Office found uh, earlier this year that the, if, if the current, the old system was in place, it would cost the government about $50 billion uh, over, I'm trying to remember the time frame, um, but by comparison, say, over that same period of time, um, the, uh, the, the liberal plan, the liberal pension is $32 billion, and before that, the system that was in place between 2006 and 2018 would have been $29 billion. So you see, I mean, it's a huge amount of money. But the veterans then come back and say, well, there were a lot more veterans. We've got our first, second World War veterans who are dying. Uh, the first World War is no longer here. Where is that money going? And that's a fair question, I think, a lot of veterans ask, is uh, where has that money gone? Uh, Tom, back in April, the Royal Canadian Legion sent out a letter to members of Parliament outlining areas where you'd like to see uh, what you call noticeable improvement. Where are the gaps in the treatment of veterans today, in your view? Where are the gaps? Well, the, one of the things right off the top of my head is the waiting times. Um, the waiting times are unacceptable. Um, another another one is homeless homelessness. We're waiting for a lot of information on that. Transition to civilian life is important. Uh, we're waiting for that. Research, uh, veteran research and medical um, uh, research, Cannab cannabinoid-based uh, research, and uh, 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 mefloquine is what I'm looking at. Uh, these are important researches that, uh, that that have to be done, and we're still waiting for services, service dogs, uh, a standard for service dogs that the government uh, promised us. There's many gaps, but these are the main ones that I'm looking at. Sean, uh, did Canada treat veterans better in the past than they do today? In a word, yes. Um, first of all, like I, I already pointed to, is that all veterans, when, when they released from military, were provided with help. So if we go back to you know, World War I, Canada didn't do such a great job, even though in the world we had one of the better rehabilitation programs. But you know, for instance, veterans were contributing to the Winnipeg General Strike. So they saw this disaffected veteran population uh, as a potential threat to, to uh, security of, uh, you know, of our social system. So uh, Mackenzie King, very early on, 1939, we just entered the war. We're only three months into the war. We didn't even know if we were going to you know, come out of this uh, and win. Mm -hmm. And Mackenzie King gave authorization to start planning for reestablishment because he realized that every veteran needed help to get back. Um, because all of these symptoms, homelessness, you know, whether it's suicide, um, you know, uh, substance abuse, all of these can be linked about how does that transition experience happen. So they realized that, listen, all veterans need help. 
they offered, you know, famously we hear about the university attendance at World War II, but it was only about 5% of veterans that actually actioned that. Uh, about another 10% went to vocational schools uh, and learned a skill set there. Uh, others started farms, um, but also the majority, the vast majority of veterans took a lump sum payment. Uh, they were provided with free health and dental care for, for a certain period, um, but they were also given priority placements. So they were looking within a one year of the war ending, or sorry, within two months of these veterans getting home, that we had 85% employment of veterans coming back when it was an unsure economy initially right after the war. So this sort of approach, we had veterans affairs workers willing to work seven days a week. They went to the sites of the farms. They went to the sites. They had building assistance for their houses. They had people that want to start businesses. They had a, a apprenticeships as well as business loans as well as advice how to start this business this sort of comprehensive picture doesn't exist the main reason it doesn't exist is because the issue is at government we've got veterans affairs isolated in PEI the only federal department that exists outside of Ottawa it's really far from accountability from a lot of the other government oversight bodies um, World War II we had a governing council of about half a dozen ministers from the most important ministries that oversaw 13 subcommittees that focused on issues such as women's issues, uh, focused on, on issues of the blind and the amputees, as well as vocational rehabilitation. They reported directly to those ministers. Those programs were implemented in three years time frame. We had programs in place for one million returning veterans, the best program in the world. Mm. We're still 15 years after this new veterans charter now, we're going on 15 years and we're still having backlogs. We're still having people falling through the cracks. The problem is, is that we have to take it out of veterans affairs hands and we have to put it into a higher government agency and we have to widely consult. Which agency would you? Well, I, I would think a council of ministers mm. uh, that has reporting to it, or it could be a, a parliamentary committee. Uh, and then we have reporting to them people that can make some firm binding recommendations that work on women's issues, that work on suicide issues, mental health issues, mm -hmm. homelessness, and they all report directly in a very public manner. Where right now, all recommendations by the existing advisory groups are kept confidential, their minutes are confidential, uh, and basically they're lost in the bureaucracy. Well, we were talking before we taped um, about the general public and how the general mm -hmm. public receives veterans. Um, do you think, what role do you think uh, the general public place right now when we talk about veterans, especially during an election. Rosemary? Oh, yeah. One of the, I believe the external advocacy groups that are uh, advising or working with Veterans Affairs, so for example, the National, uh, NAFER, National Association of Federal Retirees have put the issues for veteran um, veterans, including RCMP, higher on their list so that strategically what we're seeing is that in this larger com general community we have voices that are speaking for veterans not needing then individual veterans to have to be in front of the camera mm -hmm. so that type of of advocacy that uh, our guests all are here to do um, is that middle space between the general public, which I would venture to say, I haven't done the, the polling, has this is not high on their not higher on their list. Tom, I'd love to hear what you think about that. I agree, it's not higher in, in the public's um, list of priorities, but also um, years and years and years ago, the military wouldn't even wear their uniform in public, or once they left the bases, they were told to wear civilian clothes. That's the, the attitude has changed since Bosnia and Afghanistan. And I, I, I agree that the only time that the Canadian public really jumps on board with the veterans is if we're in some kind of action like Bosnia or Afghanistan. But once they come home, it kind of wanes off a little bit. And during an election time, uh, there's not very many issues. And I don't see the issues coming up uh, this year. I know that the NDP and the well, all three parties have just started coming up with their with their programs, but I don't feel that the Canadian public is totally on board with it. It's just another subject that, like uh, seniors or something else. Um, like I said, is they, they just pay attention more during when we're actually in action or, or um, in the field. That has to hurt on a personal level, no? It does. Very much so. Uh, when you look at different different operations that Canadian forces have been over the years, uh, sometimes they get big uh, homecomings 
and the guys from Bosnia are forgotten about. You know, depending on which area, which theater are in will depend on, on their homecoming. And, and that's wrong. When I came back from the Middle East in the 70s as a peacekeeper, the, I got a medical, got out the door and have a nice day. Whereas some people coming back, uh, some regiments coming back from action or whatever, they get a homecoming parade. We're all the same thing. We're all doing the same actions. Some are a little bit more dangerous than others, but the veteran is a veteran. We only have a few minutes left, um, and I want to get a couple of questions more in. Lee, what's on offer from the political parties uh, during this election? So we've just started seeing the, the platforms coming out, as Tom had referenced. Um, the Liberals right now, um, it, on Sunday, they rolled out their entire platform, and they don't. They, they seem to be almost kind of tinkering a, r a bit around the edges. Uh, I mean, there's some important uh, promises in there, if you will, um, things like uh, helping uh, homeless veterans, um, things like having, a, I guess, a response, a quick response team, reach out to every veteran um, to see how they're doing, you know, if they are struggling with any mental health issues or things like that. But, you know, I don't know if, if we've got a backlog of 40,000 applications and we've got, um, you know, of, of veterans waiting to find out whether they qualify for benefits and we have, um, you know, problem, uh, veterans having problems already accessing case managers and mental health services, uh, I, I, I don't under, I'm not quite sure how uh, they're going to find the government is the liberals I would should say are going to find the people to be able to do that and what that you know team who's reaching out to veterans what are they going to do just tell them hey these are services available in which case you then have to line up for them um, will they actually provide services it's not really clear um, you know the veter the liberals have been talking about homeless veterans for a couple of years as far as uh, we're still waiting for a, a homeless veteran strategy to be rolled out um, so you know there's things that they're promising but things they you know they're not talking about the pension, they're not talking about necessarily about the, the wait times the, um, that, uh, well, the Conservatives are. So the Conservatives uh, about a week ago laid out their plan and they said that they would tackle the wait times, they would uh, address the backlog, um, they would uh, address uh, fairness issues, if you will, in, uh, in the pension, uh, the Liberals' pension plan. Again, the details are a little bit uh, unclear, um, but I know I've talked to a couple of veterans who have said that at least, the, you know, the, the Conservatives are kind of speaking the right language, saying the right things at this point in time. Again, other veterans are saying, well, we can't trust them to begin with. So, you know, we're kind of back in this back and forth situation. Um, the Greens the Greens and the NDP have both said when it comes to, uh, especially when it comes to the pension, that they'll review uh, the current system and figure out where, what needs to be done to fix it. But they haven't really come down hard on in terms of what they would do to address the situation. The Greens have said that in the meantime, while they're conducting that review, they would reinstate kind of the pre-2006 pension payments, if you will. But again, details are, are a little bit skimpy, kind of all around, if you will. In many ways, uh, aside, from, um, aside from Andrew Scheer, uh, of the four main parties, um, you know, the, he's the only one who's really had a big event to, to address uh, veterans' issues. And the other leave three have kind of mentioned it. But. Yeah. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Lee, thank you so much for your time, and Tom as well. We appreciate you being here with us. Um, remotely, and Sean and Rosemary, thank you so thank much you. for coming to the TVO studio. Uh, we appreciate uh, you letting us in on something that more Canadians should know about. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.